thanks for the introduction. I'm going to jump right in. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about imaging with x-rays, in particular x-ray fluorescence microscopy, with an emphasis on plants and soil systems. So for those of you that don't know where I'm coming from, I'm in New York. I'm a Californian that's been displaced to New York. So I'm at Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island, thanks to Google for these great images. We're about two thirds of the way out on Long Island. And if you zoom in close enough to the site, you can see some of the large scars from the accelerators that we have. This is a Rick a scar here, that's the high energy ring. And then the NSLS2 is this little guy down there. And it's, it's actually big enough to support 60 beam lines when it's fully built out, broken up into various programs. So um, we have about 30 beam lines operating now. And across, uh, while each end station is unique and optimized perhaps for a different user community, what's common about them is they offer experiments with different modes of contrast with x-ray. So scattering to imaging to spectroscopy. And there's been a big emphasis in the last five or six years about multimodal measurements, not only single end stations being multimodal, but being able to do multimodal measurements both across beam lines at the facility and across facilities, even including PNNL. So this big emphasis on multi-technique approaches to these complex heterogeneous systems. Now, light source two is still organized by technique. And so it's a little hard to point to which beam lines do what science, but I'd say the majority of biological and environmental science happens in the imaging and microscopy program and the hard X-ray scattering and spectroscopy. Not to say that they aren't distributed in other programs, but I'm gonna highlight these programs for our community. The first program is the imaging and microscopy program. And this is a family of X-ray fluorescence microscopes. I'm in charge of the X-ray fluorescence microprobe. That's a hard X-ray imaging beam line that does spectroscopy. But we have other beam lines that do tender X-ray measurements or submicron measurements or even nanoscale measurements. And one instrument that's a full field imaging beam line for ultrastructure, looking at biological ultrastructure at a very fine scale. Resolution of, again, nanometers there. This program is led by Young Chu, who you can see in the upper left corner here. And Young has been excellent at really getting this program to work together to do multimodal measurements and even published in the Synchrotron Radiation News, a nice multimodal experiment across the beam lines in the program. Now, the reason we have a family of microscopes is that collectively we are able to cover a broad range of energy and spatial scales with those instruments. Now we have some neighbors close by that do hard X-ray spectroscopy, and that's heavily used by uh, the biological and environmental science community. So let me introduce you to Eric Dorhe in the upper left corner here, who's the program manager for this program. And a number of the operating beam lines are again offering techniques very useful to geo and environmental science, powder diffraction, if you're familiar with the pair distribution function, scattering approach, but a lot, of, a lot of work is done with spectroscopy, bulk XFs, micro XFs, quick zanes, and even some emission spectroscopy and some other inner shell type spectroscopies that are, are done across this set of beam lines. And there's a new beam line that's for high energy diffraction that's coming online soon that I'll tell you about. And then we have labs nearby this family of beam lines that give access to the users to do sample prep. Let me kind of give you a, a look inside. Uh, first, I'll point out you don't want to have a geochemist without a lab. That's a bad thing. Um, so we have these well-equipped well -equipped labs near the laboratories, and we're even tooling up a new cryo sample prep lab. Uh, this is part of a BER project to do um, more imaging of biological systems, like I will show you in a few minutes, and being able to do a cold sample workflow that would allow us to take that imaging down to the subcellular, or at least the cellular level, when you really have to be careful about sample preparation and forming vitreous ice if, uh, and not lysing cells open if you wanna see the distribution of elements inside themselves. But anyway, this point of this slide is we've got these really great labs next to the beam lines they are heavily used uh, and, and very helpful for our community. I stole this slide uh, from our strategic planning workshop a couple years ago. We um, at NSLS2 brought together five different communities. I, I, I was leading the biological and environmental sciences community. And, and what we did is we brought the community here and we had a look at what capabilities they have been using, what they need in the future, and maybe what's missing at Light Source 2. And so this kind of map is what kind of technique is offered at what beamline. So with help from the community, the first loud and clear answer we got 
who has more capacity. And we all recognize the x-ray measurements take a long time in some cases, or it's just not a lot of access. So even having access to the instruments we have now, more of that would be useful. But there was also some key uh, holes and gaps. So a lot of you talked about carbon and looking at carbon chemistry and cycling. And so a, a scanning transmission x-ray microscope was at the top of our community's wish list, as well as a micro CT instrument for doing like pore scale work, looking at heterogeneity in, in uh, sediments and soils. And finally, a tender x-ray nanoprobe, again, with a way of looking at phosphorus, not only its distribution, but its chemistry, um, its speciation, as well as some other light elements, at least light for x-rays, um, such as carbon and sulfur. So as an outcome of that workshop, uh, uh, this is right off our website. We are currently, you know, the facility is developing four additional beam lines to suit those communities that had come together. And I think two of these beam lines speak to all our community needs. And the first one I'll point to is HEX, which I kind of mentioned at Eric's program, where um, they're going to have some hard, hard x-rays way above 40 kV. This allows you to punch through a lot of soil or a lot of material. You could have um, buried interfaces, you can have sample cells that are quite thick and you can still get information from them and even in 3D. So some tomography type capabilities with hard x-rays coming online with HEX. And then SXN or a soft x-ray nano imaging is very much like the Stixum we were hoping for. And it does offer some spectroscopy tools with nanometer spatial resolution and accessing important edges like carbon through sulfur. So this will be an important beamline for our community that will be uh, coming online in, in, in a few years. So uh, let me, from now and the rest of my time, focus on instrumentation that we have on the floor now. And, and uh, mostly this will be in the imaging and microscopy program across those beam lines I, I mentioned in Young Chu's program. Four of the five are what we call scanning X-ray fluorescence microscopes, kind of like the diagram you see here. And these instruments are really excellent for looking um, at in, doing in situ microanalysis of soils and sediments and complex heterogeneous materials. They offer element specific detection. So imaging and spectroscopy using fluorescence contrast, spatial resolutions of these instruments range from microns to nanometers and detection sensitivity is really excellent on the scale of you know, picograms. We might just call that ultra trace, uh, PPB level detection sensitivity in many cases. And there's a very little, if any, sample prep that goes into a lot of what we do with you know, the exception of, I'd say, the biological community, which we've got more work than most to, to deal with the ionizing radiation. And I will, I will show you some examples of that. Um, so first, scanning X-ray fluorescence microscope. This is, happens to be XFM beamline. But uh, a lot of these instruments the, in our family offer micro XRF. So you get an energy dispersive spectrum that shows you which elements are there and what their abundances are relative to each other. And it can be fully quantified. Now you can propagate this in a mapping mode because these are scanning probes. So we can sweep the sample back and forth and repeat that measurement and pre prepare 2D images of the samples showing you where the elements are and how much is in which box basically. But we can even play some games with the tunable energy and we can do mapping of oxidation states and a few other spectroscopic imaging like modalities. Or we can do this in 3D where we rotate the sample and do a fluorescence tomography and we get a view inside a, a seed for instance to see the trace element distribution in a cross section of the seed without actually cutting it open. We have a couple of users that do ionomic studies that uh, do knockouts of single mutant genes and then they use the seed to look at the embryonic plant, the wild type and the mutant, and make some interesting reverse engineering of transporters and such that the plants are upregulating up in various conditions in the soil, iron deplete conditions and so on. But the real, I think the real advantage of these X-ray microscopes, at least in my mind, is the tunability of the X-rays. And this allows us to do some pretty sophisticated spectroscopic measurements and core shell related excitations. So what we call zanes and XAFs, spectroscopies, and these can be done on a bulk scale and you know, over a larger area, or they can be done at every or any point of an image, which I'll show you uh, shortly here. So those are very useful for determining oxidation states or chemical speciation. In the case of XAFs, you can even get first and second shell uh, neighbor distances and, and, um, and really understand the local coordination environment around the central absorber. So I'll give one example of that toward the end. And then, of course, we can couple this with micro XRD. So if you uh, are interested in the speciation of some element, 
and you want to know what minerals it's bound or occluded to, the micro diffraction can uh, provide some ancillary information as you're um, trying to characterize a heterogeneous system. This first example, I'm not going to drill down a lot on the science, and I'm only kind of showing you the highlights from the synchrotron. Imagine there's a ton of work that happens in these lab before they come to our facility. This is work with the Tracy Punchin at, at Dartmouth, and this is an ionomics study where they were looking at alpha-alpha, and they had knocked out the CAX1 gene, which they thought was responsible for a, a calcium localization in this plant. And then we made images, as you can see on the left, of the wild type and the, and the mutant. Now, if you're not used to looking at these images, and I don't have the color bar here, the darker colors are lower calcium, and the brighter colors are higher calcium. So the wild type has the secondary veins fairly enriched with calcium. And that's the opposite distribution you're seeing in the leaf of the mutant, where the intervenal region is actually more enriched with calcium than the secondary veins. So we wanted to understand more that difference between those images. So we went to the cryosectioning tool, and we actually took a cross-section of the leaf and looked down um, in cross-section at that, at, at that distribution. And that's what you're seeing below. So the wild type leaf has these two really bright spots above and below the secondary veins, which is just not the case in the, in the mutant plant. So going to upper right corner, a little higher resolution now, we're able to zoom in and understand that these crystals look to be like they have a morphology, almost a hexagonal morphology. You can do follow-on Zane's measurements and understand that this happens to be a calcium oxalate crystal that's forming in these idioblast compartments of the wild type plant. Um, that's called wetolite. The Zane's technique is works for gases, liquids, solids. It doesn't require any crystallinity. So this is telling us that we have wetolite there. We don't really know if it's crystalline or amorphous. It could be both. Now, the diffraction technique is giving us the same answer, thankfully. Uh, it's fairly weak signal. These aren't huge crystals, a pretty small diffracting volume. But it does show, it gives you complementary information. And it does also indicate that some of this material, this calcium oxalate that's accumulating in the wild type, actually is crystalline oxalates. So it, it, it turns out these are just a storage form of calcium in the idioblast cells. It's no big surprise. But the mutant, what was so interesting is that the, the mutants had the same amount of calcium and the same morphology and the same bulk concentration. But on the local scale, the calcium wasn't stored in an insoluble form that's not available to humans and animals, but was instead store, stored in a bioavailable form that was easily, easily absorbed. So as, as far as a ionomics project, this was a, a very successful outcome for them. I like to show it because it kind of it kind of connects the imaging with the spectroscopy and the diffraction measurement in a biological system. These are typically more uh, commonly applied to in geological systems. So here's one example of a geological system that was under study by Don Sparks Group at the University of Delaware, which is my alma mater. I'm actually still connected with uh, this team. And this was some thesis work by Josh Lamont, and it was a contaminated site in Delaware. And the questions they were asking, this was an NSF funded project, we're looking at sea level rise and how that would mobilize contaminants in, in these sites that are contaminated near sea level. And this particular site was an old tannery. Actually, it got a long site history um, with arsenic contamination. And so the hypothesis we had was, well, when saltwater inundation happens, that's going to cause a lot of desorption. And we're going to see a lot of arsenic come into solution. And the other uh, perturbation we were doing to compare was a river water inundation, which we expected would have a lot less effect on arsenic release. But um, we were totally wrong, but that's fine. So, it, and the reason we were wrong is when you, when you look at the speciation in the, in the contaminated soil, just to start, it wasn't a sorption complex. It wasn't the case where there was a lot of arsenic adsorbed to soil particles. It was instead the case where there was a, and this is like a teabag situation, you can imagine near the water table, where you've got this iron arsenic co-precipitate, a solid phase that's, that's actually building up in the soil. And that's the most reactive phase. So uh, it turned out that the, the river water was causing much more release of arsenic into solution, at least double. And in the end, we understood this through a stabilization effect, where the seawater had so much sulfate and other anions that typically prevent reductive dissolution of the metal oxyhydroxide that had arsenic in it. So we kind of had the, uh, an opposite effect here where the seawater was protecting the contaminated phase. But we didn't find that out just by looking at the bulk uh, spectra, because the bulk spectra on the right are a compound, a, lin a linear combination of many different arsenic species, because we've averaged over a large area. And this is pretty common with the microprobe work 
that we do bulk so we can understand who the big players are, the most significant species in, in, in a contaminated soil, for instance, but it's not telling us the whole story. And it's not until you drill down with the microprobe and discover a whole lot of the end members that make up the bulk spectra, and you really need that information to feed back into the, into the interpretation of the bulk data. So this is just another example where spectroscopy is essential for what a lot of us do uh, in the environment in heterogeneous systems. And it often has to be uh, done at multiple scales to get the complete picture. So um, this is a new development at LightSource 2. I, I don't know too many other places in the world where this can happen. So this is kind of exciting. But this is looking now at Zane's spectroscopy at the nanometer scale on the order of tens of nanometers. Um, they are using the zone plate in this example. So I should technically say 50 nanometers, let's be fair. But this beamline does routinely hit 10, 10 nanometer spatial resolution with the multi-layer Lowy lenses that they tend to use. But the reason for this slide is to show that there are developments ongoing now in our group. This is some work uh, by Ajit Padamatel, who's a postdoc in our program, Young's program. And he's been really pushing this pyrite oxidation project to really understand, can we use spectroscopy at the nanoscale to really understand these type of transformations on a single particle level? And there's been some very promising results. In, in this case, the spectroscopy is done in an imaging mode. And so you end up stacking up images and getting a spectra at every pixel. And so we decided to come up with ways of averaging like spectra together to get good enough uh, signal to noise to then interpret. But it's very promising and exciting development. And uh, likewise, uh, I think our community really needs to have the full energy range accessible to them for imaging and spectroscopy. And there's a lot of coupled biogeochemical cycling of iron and carbon, for instance. Um, obviously, to be able to study iron and to be able to study carbon in the same system can be really important. Uh, and so we have developed soft and tender probes to, to really do that. And we have to kind of think about this happening at multiple scales. So, um, I think it, going forward, more and more soft and tender spectroscopies are going to be showing up at light source at light source two. And here's one example of just real quick of a multimodal project. This is again coming from Delaware Group, but they use the test beam line, which is the tender X-ray and spectroscopy imaging beam line here at light source two, to collect a map of phosphorus and also show in context some of the aluminosilicate minerals that are in the soil. And you see that in the top right. Now the image below is from my beam line and it's actually the exact same sample area, even though the image looks completely different, I'm showing you iron, calcium and manganese. And so it's really neat to be able to see how the hard X-ray can offer you uh, insight to the hard, to heavy elements like iron. And then the soft X-rays can show you a, a lot about phosphorus and even the spectroscopy capabilities for phosphorus lets you interrogate the chemical speciation and oh, okay, find out that's a phosphorus phosphate bound to an iron oxide. And we can even confirm that from the iron edge, where you can see co-localization of phosphorus with iron and manganese. So that it's kind of nice to be able to get confirmation from uh, different places of, of what's happening in the soil. So in this case, phosphorus speciation is being heavily controlled by iron and manganese. No big surprise. Um, I wanted to mention a couple things about custom sample environments. You know, uh, a lot of the uh, Mineralogy that gets done in diamond and anvil cells, we see some of those coming to the microprobe. Because the beams are small and you can get a sample in there between the diamond and then do some high pressure work, that's not as common as some of the other devices I'm, I'm showing here, which are more uh, about exploring heterogeneity in a system. So the microfluidic device I, I show up top is from Leslie Shores Lab at the University of Connecticut. And this is a really nice one because she's got a, a natural pore scale distribution that's coming from x-ray computed tomography and uh, some really nice opportunities to do poor, poor scale chemistry in, in systems like that. I'll talk a little bit more about the cryo stage and the ecosystem science in the following slides and just mention that sometimes we use inert gas environments to get to really um, oxygen sensitive samples or low Z measurements in, in helium or something like that. So uh, this, is, this is not the same microfluidic device I showed you a second ago. This one was developed at MIT. This is from Ben Kokar's lab. And uh, this was a, a an etched silicon device. The, the, the previous device was a PM, PMDA or, or, or some sort of you know, polymer type device. This one's actually etched in silicon and covered with a glass cover slip that's x-ray transparent. And this was more of a demonstration project. Uh, you know, Michael Chen was working on this as part of his PhD. 
And he did some really cool demonstration projects on looking at uh, poor scale chemistry and how iron oxide are forming um, in between different pore geometries and then how arsenic is interacting with that iron oxide. Again, this is all kind of done in situ. And then they're able to quench that flow of bromine tracer through. And once that comes through, they flow the sulfide. And then they start having arsenic reduction happening in the smallest pores, but not in the largest pores where other gases and stuff can get in there. So it's, it's a really a, a lot going on, but it's an interesting uh, development for X-ray microprobe and, and certainly something to look at uh, as an enabling future technology. And this is a, a, a system that we've been working on for a couple of years with the BER community. This is for uh, bioimaging under cold conditions. And this is a, a portable uh, system that we take across uh, several of the imp beam lines, uh, hopefully to the tender energy beam line soon. Um, this can also go into the ancillary lab, and you can look at this under the visible light microscope uh, before and after uh, you make measurements at the beam line if you need to. This is showing, again, the XFM beam line with the cryo stage installed. And, and below the cryo stage in the bottom left corner, we're showing you some Zane spectra. And you don't have to know a whole lot about Zanes to say, well, on the left at room temperature, I don't get the same answer when I scan the second time or the third time. Things are changing in scan to scan. So that's not good. If we cool the sample down and repeat that measurement, we consistently get a, an arsenic-3 result. So that means we're able to mitigate a lot of the damage from ionizing radiation, which is mostly caused in wet samples due to radiolysis. So when we look at wet samples, especially if we're going to put them under a lot of, of X-ray dose, like we are for the spectroscopy, it's a good idea to, to try to get them as cold as you can. And a lot of the bulk work that's done on systems like this is actually done at helium cryostat temperatures, which would be pretty hard to establish in the footprint that uh, we have to work in uh, on the microscope. So minus 150 is as good as we get, but in a lot of cases, that is good enough. And then the other microcosm, also for a BR uh, project, I wanted to show you guys was, um, and I don't have to tell you how cool ectomycorrhizal fungi I are, I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is a, a fun project that I've been working on with some of my collaborators, some of your collaborators, in fact, I imagine. So this is, you know, Redis Vilgalis at Duke, um, Jenny Batnagar at Boston, and Sunny Liao at the University of Florida. And, um, you know, this is the Pinus Sulea system. And, and we had some early observations of, of the roots and symbiosis causing release of nutrients in soil. And so we designed a model soil system to interrogate a hypothesis along those lines. And I'm gonna skip all this because everybody here knows what the rhizosphere is. They know what mycorrhiza are. We're talking about ectomycorrhiza for pine. And you all know iron's an important nutrient. This is from uh, Marshner's text, Mineral Nutrition of Higher Plants. This is showing the concentration of uh, iron species in equilibrium with iron oxides, like you might find in, in soil, in oxic soil. And then drawing some comparisons to plant requirements, which are several orders of magnitude higher. So those plants probably have to work pretty hard to get iron. And you probably know there's several different strategies that, uh, that go on. So I want to show you some results from the imaging microcosm that we had early on that are pretty, pretty exciting. Um, now, this three color image, a false color image, shows iron in red, potassium in blue, and silicon in green. And most of the silicon is not coated with iron, it's just the clean sand. There was about 60 grains out of 100 that were coated. And um, on the left, without the ectomycorrhizal fungi, those coatings are fairly intact and you know, rather as uniform as they were when we uh, put the sand together. That's not the case when you bring the mycorrhizal fungi into the equation. Um, you start to notice that these coatings slowly disintegrate and fall to pieces. Uh, and then also there's a very obvious rhizosheath um, around this root that's heavily enriched with iron that you can see that's not um, on the uh, root without the mycorrhizal, without the ectomycorrhizal fungi. And this is uh, showing a similar idea. It's just that here I'm only showing you the iron in a multi colored um, scale so that you can see that the morphology is so different between the two systems. It, it was also fun that we noticed another root come by, I'll go back one, at a later time point. And that's not too uncommon, it turns out. I, I'm finding pretty often we'll see a, a root forage along a path that had been taken previously. Now, likely it, the plant was upset that I made an image of this and it sent down another root. Um, we see, I, I think, some evidence of that kind of thing happening too. So we tend not to image the same roots twice, although we did in this case. There's some really interesting clues that you can pick up in the trace elements, and, and this is that new root that was coming by. So one of these days, we hope to really unpack this, understand 
what it is telling us. Um, and it was also fun that we had a, a visible light time point of, of this particular system. So a lot, lot going on here in the imaging. And no, no one likes to look at squiggles. So, you know, I'm just going to say real quick, these squiggles of iron K edge zanes let us uh, do spatially resolved speciation work in the rhizosphere. And you can just see from the, the, the energy separation of the oxidation states that the iron metal is easily separated from the iron two, is easily separated from the iron three. And even the iron three compounds that are different from each other have some features that allow us to distinguish them from each other in many cases. So um, when it comes to the iron speciation in the soil, it's pretty boring. If you look at the big grains, it's still all the ferry hydrite that we started with. And even the little ones that fall off are still ferry hydrite. But when you look at the plant, we find something quite different. Um, and this is particularly this image is targeting the short roots with the dichotomous branching, like you see this diagram from Rule and Marks in the upper right corner. And here's one of our short roots. And this spectra in the upper left just shows an iron two standard. This is where the iron edge position should come out. We expected to find iron two. Um, we, we don't see much iron two, uh, at least in the short roots. But we do see very consistency, a whole bunch of iron three, no matter where we look. And we can even do, I mentioned you can do some games with the imaging where you can repeat the image at different energies, and then you can back out an oxidation state map. And so that's what you're seeing here on the right for iron two and iron three. So we were pretty surprised to find such a dominant iron three system. Now, this is another image of the rhizosphere. Here's the tap root. It's really faint in this calcium channel I'm showing you. Here's the lateral root coming out and some short roots dropping down from it. Um, you know, so we started doing some spectroscopy on the calcium because we saw these crazy little tiny spots showing up months. And we're like, what, what are these things? It uh, turns out they're calcium oxalate crystals, kind of like we saw in the leaf. But um, looking in the literature, we noticed other people have seen uh, calcium oxalate crystals on high of soleus and even found that oxalate production can be enhanced by calcium or, or calcium carbonate in that case. Others have even found that the extent of the calcium oxalate accumulation taken together with the photosynthate translocation to hyphae seems to infer that the weathering is driven by the carbon supply from the plant. So that's kind of a neat uh, connection there. And what we think happening uh, with, is that calcium oxalate, or, or more correctly, the free oxalate uh, part, is playing a role in the, in the iron acquisition mechanism. Because when we look at this same rhizosphere, this is the iron channel, the same root system with the short roots and so on. And we explore, now we're using what's called an extended zanes, or, or XAFs is the other term, to look at the, the, the coordination environment beyond the first shell. And what we're trying, what we're starting to see is that we're, we're picking up an iron three siderophore complex, very similar to iron oxalate or iron hydroxamate. This technique would have a bit hard time just, just discerning carbon and nitrogen in the higher shell. So I'm throwing them both out and there's enough literature about hydroxamate and fungi to think it could be either one. Either of these ligands or even something with a larger R group, this part is important because it forms this five-membered ring with the mineral surface, this bidentate chelating geometry, and that's what's gonna drive a ligand-promoted dissolution of the iron oxide that we are seeing. So um, in this slide, I'm trying to kind of summarize the, uh, the non-reductive ligand-promoted dissolution mechanism uh, first described by Werner Stone. I'm gonna animate this in PowerPoint if I can. Remember how to start the, here comes our inner sphere, to bidentate chelating, destabilizing. This is the slow step, the metal ligand detachment, plucking it out, and then returning that metal chelator to the hyphae or to the plant itself. Then here comes more, this repeats, and you just have a surface controlled dissolution of the iron oxides by this ligand promoted dissolution without reduction, which is what I think was so sh shocking uh, to us. So the last thing I wanted to say about this, this project, this is my favorite slide. Let me orient you a little bit. In the upper left is kind of our big field of view where you can see two branched root segments coming out. This little box is where we're looking at here. So we're between these two short roots that are sticking up. And then we're, that's where we are here in the center field now. And um, what we've done is again, an oxidation state game with iron. We're still searching this high and low for iron too. After like a year and a half, this is the only evidence I have to show you of iron two, and it's in the coolest place, right? Um, now, I, I had shown you the short roots. They're definitely pumping out oxalates, bringing in iron oxalate, and perhaps delivering that straight to these cortical regions. 
or perhaps the chelator is floating around in the soil solution as well, like it would be in a hydroponic situation. Either way, at some level, there seems to be iron reduction happening right in that epidermal region where we'd expect it to be transferred into the vascular cylinder and come back into it, come back to an iron three compound at, by the time it gets into this, into the vascular churn on its way up uh, and onto the plant. So I think what this says is that although the, the regular mode of delivery in this system is, is ectomycorrhizal fungi delivery to the cortical cells, the plant can still use its iron reductase system to um, acquire iron two from this bath of iron three chelators, which I think is just a really, really cool result. So um, now back to kind of the emerging technologies topic for just another minute or two. This whole project I've been ranting about with, with our collaborators uh, is really a, a larger project to develop a full field fluorescence imaging system. This is a couple years out. Everything I've been showing you has been done with the scanning probe. So, you know, it takes time to go through and, and make all that happen. We've been uh, uh, willing to give up some field of view and constrain that to say a millimeter and to give up some resolution. Say, okay, fine, 10 microns is good enough. But rather than scanning every pixel and building up the image, I just want it. I just want the image in one shot. And that's what we're trying to do with this imaging system that's funded by BER. And we're uh, working with the Brookhaven National Lab Instrumentation Office, in particular, Peter Siddons, who developed the Maya detector. Well mentioned in just a second, and so um, this system would 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 allow for dynamic studies and things to you know temporal type questions to be asked because we should be able to get that full one by one millimeter image really quick in a few seconds. I'm almost on my last slide. So I mentioned Peter Siddons. He's the developer of the Maya detector. It's installed in Australia. And these um, will allow for high throughput imaging. So if you wanted to make an image of a whole soil thin section, you could do that with a, with a detector like this. It has a huge solid angle and a huge dynamic range. And so some of the examples on this slide are from the Australian synchrotron, but huge field of view and done very quickly. So again, we're, we're pushing toward higher throughput imaging for these type of, of systems. And the last thing I wanna say is that we uh, do these hands-on workbenches and we haven't done one in a couple of years for obvious reasons, but we have another one coming up this April five through seven. And this one's a little different. We're gonna do a multimodal workbench with a plant microbe interaction theme. And even Sunny in the upper left corner, this is Sunny Liao, uh, who, who's responsible for a lot of the tree work that you just saw. Um, she, she'll be uh, on site to help us with part of this. We're gonna do some measurements upstream of it. But if you're interested to participate as a PI, to come on site at Brookhaven with a group member of yours and spend some time with the Beamline staff in the labs doing sample prep to do multimodal imaging across some of the imaging and microscopy beamlines from hard to tender x-rays from microns to nanometers and then process some of that data and interpret some of it together with Beamline staff so you can have a better feel for how maybe these techniques might fit into your own research. If you're interested, there is very limited space. Please email me, reach out in the next couple of weeks and give me a sentence or two about your research interests and activities. And with that, I'll just say, I hope to see you come meet our director, John Hill, and come do some science at LightSource too. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Takara. That was a really awesome presentation. I think you got a bunch of people really excited, especially with your Iron 2 images. <laughs> uh, how badly are the roots damaged by the beam? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's a really hard one to answer because not every beam is the same. And the answer really comes in in, in this context of, of brightness. So um, when, you, when you start to look at the nanometer scale and you try to put a whole lot of x-rays into a tiny little spot, that creates a, a brightness condition that is very damaging. So the undulator beam lines that are used to do the nano imaging are quite, are quite invasive. Um, now there's these bend magnet beam lines, which have you know maybe been somewhat of a second class uh, in, 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 as far as generating X-rays. But but when it comes to our community for biological and environmental science, these have a low enough brightness, but still a high enough intensity to get the chemical information we want without causing irreversible damage. So let me just, the last thing I wanna say about that is I mentioned like the one root, I made an image of it. It probably didn't like that. So it sent the other root down. So it doesn't kill the root. It just decides, oh, I'm probably not gonna keep putting resources there. There's a, you know, nothing's 
good happening there. I'm going to send another route down. So we try to just, we have fiducialized markers and we keep track of where we've been because we do bring the samples to the growth chamber for weeks at a time. And then they come back to the beamline for a day and repeat. Awesome. Um, do you struggle with reduction of redox sensitive elements other than arsenic? Yeah. So, you know, there are a group of elements that we pay a lot more of attention to. There, like you mentioned, the redox sensitive elements like arsenic, chromium, you can sneeze on chromium six <laughs> and reduce it pretty fast, right? Um, iron and manganese, especially in wet systems. I would say this about altogether about redox and beam induced redox type effects is um, radiolysis, if you Google that, is x-ray interaction with water. And when the x-ray ionizing x-ray splits a water molecule into a hydrated electron and a free radical, you can imagine what kind of damage those can do once there's enough of them and they, and they move around and start lysing cells and that kind of stuff and causing ROS and who, you know, who knows what. But um, for, the most, for the most case, if it's wet, we, 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 the best thing is to make it very cold or to, to dry it out. As much as we don't like to do that, um, sometimes you just have to, to get the right answers. Awesome. And then one more quick question before we go to the break. Um, are you able to do any phosphorus K-edge zanes on your beam line? So phosphorus K-edge is super tricky. There's a beam line at the SSRL, that's at Stanford. It's called 14.3. It's ran by Sam Webb. He's got several beam lines there, so don't get too confused. But 14.3 is a great place to do phosphorus. The other place that is probably the world leading phosphorus beam line is here at Light Source 2. It's called TESS, the Tender Energy Spectroscopy. And that beam line has been designed from the ground up to do not only phosphorus zanes, but to do phosphorus XAFs of single particles. So, so the whole photon delivery system has really been optimized to hold a phosphorus K edge beam on a two micron particle and do full blown XF spectroscopy on it. Um, so, so that said, these are really hard measurements to do on wet systems and on, on biological tissues if they're dehydrating on you, because if it dehydrates, it's gonna move in one of the three dimensions. And that means you're not where you thought you were. And so you gotta get it to stop moving before you can measure it. So phosphorus um, is really challenging. And the nanoprobe I mentioned that, we're, that our community spoke up for also has in mind to target phosphorus K-edge, thinking about all the cool work with the vesicular vascular mycorrhizae and, and what folks would want to do subcellular level. Now we really do have to pay attention to vitreous state, cold sample workflows, uh, and, and, but it is possible and it is on, on the agenda. Awesome. It's good to know. Yeah, biology is just, it's just hard. They're the <laughs> hardest measurement. The physicists are like, oh, biologists. No, 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 guys, you guys make measurements, we are doing experiments in real time, dissection. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much. There are some more questions in the chat. I hope you can stick around and answer a little bit. Um, and we'll try to port those over to Discord as well, if anybody has any more questions. Um, but right now we have a very short break and we will reconvene with more amazing talks at 10. So thank you to all of our speakers this morning. We really appreciate it.